Coming up. If you got one that will come and bite you and attack you, I, I can catch them just that quick. Join us on the lake to find out how Cherokee noodler Kenny Limore lands the big catch. And I think it's important that Cherokee country today be depicted in an accurate way because there's so much misinformation out there. See how author Sarah Hocklatubby shares her passion for writing authentic Cherokee stories. And you might come down here and just see a number of trees and plants, but we're looking at a, a cultural landscape, something that kept communities together. Join Liz Toombs on her journey to protect and maintain our culturally historic sites. Plus, reflecting on the struggles of the past, we look back at the Cherokee Slave Revolt of 1842. You learn from the mistakes in history, not to mention Cherokee history, black history, it's all a part of American history. So it's all our story. We all need to know these stories. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation. Sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Welcome to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, capital city of the Cherokee Nation. For generations, the Cherokee story has been told by others. Today, through this groundbreaking series, we're taking ownership of our own story and telling it as beautifully and authentically as we can. I hope you enjoy these profiles of our people, our language, our history, and our culture. And please make plans to come visit us sometime. Wado. OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at the historic Hunter's Home in Park Hill, Oklahoma. Here you can learn about a small portion of Cherokees who lived a relatively extravagant lifestyle in the 19th century. Unfortunately, that included the practice of enslaved labor. We'll have more on that later in the show. Kenny Limor is a true outdoorsman. Wrestling catfish from their holes and lakes and rivers all over the Cherokee Nation, it's easy to see why he's been dubbed the Cherokee Noodler. New year, new season, new possibilities. Our strategy is going to be the same. We're going to go out here, we're going to look, we're going to try to find these fish. But until we get out there, we don't know what to expect. And to me, that's exciting. Kenny Limor, manager of the Glass Hollow Ranch in South Adair County. And I've always been an avid outdoorsman. I've hunted, fished, noodling. Well, noodling is the sport of catfishing by using your hands. It's an all day event when you go noodling. I go down to the river, go to the lake, start walking around on the banks, looking for holes and just feel and feel for an opening, feel for a void. That's what that fish does. It goes to spawn. It'll find a spot under a rock and try to work its way under and then build the nest. So when you're going noodling, you look for those nests. Patience. Can't get in a hurry. Be one at any moment. Well, we might be out here all day. It's hard to complain about being at the lake though. So when I do find one, it's clean, and I start going in, seeing how deep the hole is, seeing how big it is, and see if there's anything in there. Whenever I find one, I stick my hand in there, start feeling around, try to get him to bite me. It sounds crazy, but that's, that's the easiest way. If you got one that will come and bite you and attack you, 
I, I can catch them just that quick. Now, if they get sold up and they start trying to hide from you, that's when it becomes a challenge. You kind of have to fight that instinctive behavior of just, you know, getting away from something trying to bite you. You have to put that aside and just go in there and get it. I'm gonna go get it. Bite it, obviously. He's biting, he's biting. Well, a catfish, whenever he bites something, they tend to roll. So if you just get a couple fingers in there, he'll try to twist your hand or twist one of your fingers around, and that's when they, those are a problem. Well, and I always stick my hand in with my thumb down. So when the fish comes in, it'll bite you here, and then you just grab his jaw, ideally. There's very few times when I have my head above water when I catch that fish. Pull me up, D. Pull me up. I got him. He's got him. In that moment when you go down there and you find that fish and it's finally just you and him, it's an adrenaline rush. It feels like you're underwater forever. You got your eyes closed. You can't see anything. Not bad, boy. Oh, yeah. Well, he's pretty. Once that fish finally bites you, there's a fight there. It's probably only a fight for about two or three seconds, but it feels like a minute. But once you get that fish on the stringer and you get to lean back, it's just, it's, it's an accomplishment. You can feel that satisfaction of, I did it, I won. <laughs> it's the best feeling in the world. I don't know, it's, it's indescribable. You spend all day, you spend hours doing it just for about a minute and a half worth of fight and you know satisfaction of prevailing. Got him. So you know him. Yeah. We're at Jack Jumper Bluff in South Adair County and this is the area I've grown up my whole life. All these woods and all this wilderness I grew up coon hunting, deer hunting, riding four wheelers, trail riding. I got into noodling and the outdoors with my father, and it was something we had always done growing up, childhood. We went noodling every summer. I didn't catch a catfish with a rod and reel until I was in my late teens, because all the times we ever went catfishing, we went noodling, and we'd catch enough meat to sustain throughout the year until the next noodling season. My dad was half Cherokee. His mother was full blood original. Her first language was Cherokee. So our culture runs very deep and it's something that has been going on in my family for a few generations now. So I feel like it is part of the Cherokee culture because it's part of my culture. We go noodling on Saturday, Sunday we got a fish fry. That's the real celebration, you get to eat them. This is one of the fillets off that fish we caught. Which I'm gonna cut it in half right now to make it a little more manageable. So that's just good, white, clean meat. Sounds like our grease is getting hot. We're getting close, so it won't be long. This is the real rewarding part. You finally get together around and enjoy a fine meal. Family and good friends, that's, that's hard to beat. Sarah Hockletubby is a mystery writer whose books earn high praise from readers and critics alike. She draws on her Cherokee identity to create unique and engaging characters who keep readers on the edge of their seats. Hard to see footprints now, Wagon track Hollywood has spent decades trying to make up what they want Indian country to be like. And people see these movies, they read these books, and they think they know what Indian country's like. 
So when I started writing, I wanted to make sure that I got it right so that it would, in some small way, help educate people as to what it's like to live in Cherokee country. My name is Sarah Hoklotubby, and I am an author. My Cherokee grandmother that lived with us when I was, from the time I was young. She's the one that introduced me into digging wild onions and harvesting poke and those types of things. I do think my dad influenced me as a storyteller. Wherever he would go, he would be telling stories and people would be sitting around listening to him telling stories. So I think that maybe uh, I might have picked that up through osmosis, I'm not sure. My husband is Choctaw. A lot of people ask me about my name, that I'm Cherokee with a Choctaw name, but uh, we get along great. <laughs> my husband was working in the state of Hawaii on the island of Maui. So I moved to Maui. I found it impossible to find a job in banking. So my husband encouraged me and said, well, try to do something you'd like to do. And I said, well, I think I'd like to write. And uh, I started writing my first book when we lived on Maui. And it just turned into a mystery, mostly because that's what I like to read. I like mystery novels because of the suspense, uh, the idea of trying to solve the problem, crime, whatever it is. I am best known for the Sadie Walela mystery series. And Sadie is a young Cherokee woman in her 20s to 30s. She's independent. She's outspoken. She can speak the Cherokee language. She talks to her dog and her horse in Cherokee. She can pretty much do whatever she wants to do if she puts her mind to it. Tiny blooms fell from the Oklahoma sky, released by a nearby pear tree making way for tender spring leaves. A morning breeze carried the white flowers through Sadie's car window, attaching the delicate works of nature to her hair. She flicked at the flowers with her fingers and then applied a quick stroke of lipstick, using the rearview mirror to check her appearance. The honey-colored tint of her flawless complexion, her jet black hair, and her high cheekbones reflected her daddy's Cherokee lineage. I wanted it to reflect Cherokee country today. I don't write historicals. I wanted it to be current. I didn't have a lot of stereotypes or stereotypical characters which made it more realistic. I think it's important that Cherokee country today be depicted in an accurate way because there's so much misinformation out there. My love of travel and seeing new places, I think, started when I first moved to Hawaii to meet and know people of other cultures is a very eye-opening experience, and I think it broadens a person. It certainly did me and affected my writing in that particular way. We've traveled to islands, not only Hawaii, but islands in the Pacific, Samoa, Tahiti, down to New Zealand and Australia, and to meet the indigenous people there and to experience some of their culture, their language, their food, and to realize that we all have so much in common, the indigenous people of the world. The way that I inject culture into my books is simply by Sadie or other characters living the way they live. For instance, when I was a kid, we went out and dug wild onions. So it was natural for me to have Sadie to do that and to describe how she did it. Sadie placed several slices of bacon in her own iron skillet and started cleaning the onions in the sink. As soon as the bacon finished frying, she poured off the grease, saving just the right amount of drippings to cook the onions and the eggs together. 
Then she savored an indulgence she seldom allowed. Although wild onions were a traditional Cherokee dish, she usually ate them only at church gatherings or special wild onion dinners offered in the community. Tonight was different. I didn't want to beat people over the head with it. I just wanted it to be part of normal life. I think it's real important for Native voices to be heard in fiction. When I first started writing, there weren't a lot to go find and read. And I think it's important for Native voices to be heard in every genre. But in fiction, to try to get rid of the stereotypes and to talk about what it's really like. I feel like Native people can write about being Native better than non-Native people can. During the 18th and 19th centuries, many aspects of American life were adopted by some Cherokees who viewed assimilation as the best survival tactic against American expansion. One such adoption was the practice of chattel slavery. In this Cherokee almanac, we look back on an uncomfortable part of Cherokee history, the Cherokee Slave Revolt. Slavery in the, in the U.S. and in the Cherokee Nation was uh, not practiced by most, but it's still part of all our history. It's something that none of us are proud of, and, and you know, it's a little known fact that the Indian nations participated in, in this, but it is important that we know that part of history. By the early 19th century, most Cherokee hunting grounds had been invaded by or ceded to white settlers. The United States was actively enforcing a civilization policy toward Native Americans designed to erode traditional Cherokee social structures. As some Cherokees assimilated to Eurocentric views of agriculture for profit, some also began to implement the so-called civilized practice of chattel slavery. By 1835, nearly 1,600 people were enslaved by Cherokees. In the Cherokee Nation, it was actually 8% of the people that owned slaves, and 50% of those slaves were owned by three different owners, the main one being Joe Van. Rich Joe, like his father, was a very shrewd merchant, and um, he became the wealthiest man in the Cherokee Nation. Joseph Van, or Rich Joe Van as he was known, was forced from his home in Georgia in 1837 one year before Cherokee removal. Van traveled from the old Cherokee Nation by steamboat on the Arkansas River, finally settling in Indian Territory near Weber's Falls. He and Chief Ross, his brother, grew cotton crops, and they put the cotton on steamboats and took it back, uh, back east to sell it. Once established in Indian Territory, Joseph Van's business operations continued with relatively few obstacles until one night. At 4 a.m. on November 15, 1842, a faction of people enslaved by Rich Joe Van barricaded the doors to the Van home, trapping those inside. The group took guns, ammunition, food, mules, and horses. The plan was to go to Mexico where slavery was illegal. Approximately 25 slaves took off and headed towards the Creek Nation. In the Creek Nation, more enslaved people joined the revolt, raising the group's total number to more than 35. As the group continued southwest, they were pursued by a Cherokee and Creek search party. Eventually, the two groups collided near the southern border of the Creek Nation along the Canadian River. The escaping slaves uh, had a, a battle by the Canadian River where they disbanded the spot and uh, forced the Cherokee and Creek party to retreat. In doing so, they lost uh, 12 slaves that were captured and two were killed. Following the battle, those remaining continued on their path to Mexico when they encountered yet another obstacle, two slave hunters who had captured eight escapees from the Choctaw Nation, five of which were children. 
And when they came across those slave hunters, they ended up killing them and freeing the Choctaw slaves, and they then joined the party and moved forward. At this time, the Cherokee National Council passed a resolution authorizing Captain John Drew to head an 87-man militia to seek out and capture those participating in the revolt. The militia caught up to the group north of the Red River, just seven miles from the southern border of Indian Territory. When they found them, they were uh, in poor shape. They didn't have enough supplies to get across that rugged country. After all the miles traveled and the conflicts endured, the escapees were captured and taken back to the Cherokee Nation. The group was escorted to Fort Gibson, where five of the rebels stood trial and were executed for the murder of the bounty hunters. The rest were returned to their Cherokee Creek and Choctaw owners. Those returned to Rich Joe Van were sent to work aboard his steamship, the Lucy Walker. In 1844, the ship exploded when Van drunkenly ordered the workers to overheat the boiler. Van was killed in the accident, along with most on board. Slavery in the Cherokee Nation continued until the Cherokee National Council passed two Emancipation Acts in 1863. The abolishment of slavery was then ensured forever in the Treaty of 1866, and Cherokee freedmen were awarded tribal citizenship. You learn from the mistakes in history not to mention Cherokee history, black history, it's all a part of American history. So it's all our story. We all need to know these stories. Let's talk Cherokee. Hi, Sinas, what are you doing? Osio Warrior Jalegi Ini Wani Skesti. Hawa. Oh stop. Sinas. Kadohadana Serving as the Cherokee Nation's Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Liz Toombs feels a deep responsibility to protect our cultural assets and historic lands for future generations. We caught up with her to talk about why this is important to our survival as Cherokee people. We're outside of Bell Community in the southern part of the Cherokee Nation at a spring, Candy Mink Spring, that is named after a community leader. This place is really important historically to a number of families. Behind me, we have um, some fresh flowing water and a number of uh, plants that are really important as uh, a food source and as medicine. And so part of this role in historic preservation and cultural resource management means being able to document places of importance to communities. And it's a somewhat of a challenge. I think a lot of people, when they think about cultural resources, they think about archeology, span which is an important aspect of site and cultural resource management, but it's difficult coming to places like these and not necessarily seeing what we would consider artifacts or objects on the surface of the land. You might come down here and just see a number of trees and plants, but we're looking at a, a cultural landscape, something that kept communities together, uh, something that kept our health and spiritually physically, all of these aspects that are important to cultural survival. Our 
Our office is a National Park Service designated Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. The day to day, you know, I get a massive amount of emails and mail with requests to consult on federal projects, and that can occur anywhere in our ancestral homelands. And really that runs the gamut of anywhere from like forest management projects to um, road development to housing development to the installation of cell phone towers. Um, you know, all of these projects we see as important to infrastructure, but we also have to really balance, you know, the potential impacts that you could have on our on our history, uh, on our on our identity, and so that's why it's such an important role uh, to play in that process. So this is an old GLO survey map that would have been done in the late 1800s, marking where the Cherokee Mill Seminary is. We're on the grounds over here. Our jurisdiction is within our reservation boundaries. And uh, I also participate in consultation on projects that occur uh, in our ancestral homelands out east um, and along uh, the Trail of Tears routes and our previous treaty lands uh, along the, the Cherokee Strip. This is my folks' place. They're no longer with us. My brother and I have made sort of a commitment to make sure that we keep this area in the best way that we know how um, to keep it protected. We would be in what's considered Old Uchi. It's a suburb of Kenwood. I, they say the fastest way that you can get here is to be born here. Growing up in this area, I don't know if I realized how important it was to my identity. I, I love this place. Part of being able to do this work is making sure that um, places are still here. Uh, they're here as an expression of, of who we are, of our way of life, of our survival. And it's, it's my hope that these places will still be around for my niece, for Val Gal when she gets older, and for the generations behind her or ahead of her. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, do da dago ha'i. Wado.